Who's that? Dalton. What do you want? No, I called him earlier. See if he knew more about the particular stop. Oh. Not some fucking kid broke into a fucking car. Come to me. Kid broke into a car and was sent home. Called him to try and do something. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to the regular meeting of the Nittle City Council, June 1st, 2020 at 6 p.m. in the Council Chambers. We'll call this meeting to order, remembering, of course, that uh, I'm probably the only one online. Although it looks like maybe we have some other folks online as well. So. If you are online, please do cite your name uh, prior to speaking. If you would, join me in rising and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nothing worse than hearing yourself twice. <laughs> Very good. Hopefully, I don't hear myself again. Jackie, would you take roll call, please? Councilmember Hewlin? Here. Parker? Here. Kling? Here. Schroeder? Here. Southall? Here. Marchant? Present. Mayor Shaw? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, moving right along, we'll move on to uh, the public comment. I do know that there at least had been planned an individual to talk. Uh, Tom was going to talk to her. Hey, I'll tell you myself again. Jack, you just take the roll call, please. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's looping. <laughs> Here. Mayor Alex is taking a look, trying to figure out what's going on with us here. Right, John, today. thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, moving right along, we'll move on to uh, public comment. I do know that there at least had been planned an individual to talk. Uh, Tom was going to talk to you. I'll tell you myself again. Sound like a clean feminine. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> For it's all bad jokes being repeated. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Not a bitch. Near it's fixed. 
Is it? All right, Ryan, thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, we will move on to uh, the public comment section. Uh, I did talk to Mr. Carlton, uh, Charlton, rather, Tom. Uh, I know he wants to speak on a public hearing for the proposed development plan uh, a little bit later on page 240 of your packet. Uh, is there anybody else there for public comment this evening? Hearing none and seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, anything to poll tonight, council? Very good. The consent agenda includes the following items. Item A is approval of agenda. Item B is the May 18th, 2020 minutes. Item C are applications, including the two following, an annual renewal of cigarette permit application and street usage application for Warren County to close Ashland Avenue between Howard and Buxton from June 2nd to June 9th, starting tomorrow, 2020, due to construction of the Warren County Justice Center. Item D is a resolution approving the Police Department Union contract for 2020 and 2021. Item E is second consideration of ordinance adopting the 2020 revised code of ordinances for the city of Indianola, Iowa. Item F is a resolution approving a water meter pit installation by Warren water district in the amount of $5,400. Item G is a resolution setting the public hearing for fiscal year 21 budget amendment for July 5, 2020. Item H is a resolution authorizing the submission of the application of the Iowa Great Places grant program. Item I is resolution amending the fee schedule to include loading mulch at a brush facility. Item J is a home-based Iowa initiative application to Mr. Brian Faust, an authorization of a handwritten warrant in the amount of $1,500 under the home-based initiative plan. Item K is a resolution approving ICAP project change order number one to include a rock base for the construction of the one block section of Iowa Avenue. And item L is claims on the, com claims on the computer or claims for January 1st, 2020. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Mayor, if I may, really quick, uh, under application, the street usage from Warren County, that uh, they're proposing to actually push that back to June 8th, so do the work the week of June 8th. That was, uh, that decision was, or that change was made after publication of this agenda. All right, should we redo those dates then, Brian, or are we good now? Uh, you can, yeah, you can note it for the record. Um, uh, you want to make a, make a motion to amend it okay. for next week. So it would be the 8th through the 15th? Eight, yes. I move to amend the item C2 Correct. of the consent agenda to read June 8th through 15th. Thanks for that. Thank you. And then you have to vote on the amended motion. Right. And then the uh, thanks. Jackie, you want to take the roll call then on that amendment? Yes. Motion. Council Member Marchant? Aye. Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Very good. I do believe we do have a first and a second to approve then the consent agenda. Any discussion further? Having none, then Jackie, please take roll call. Councilmember um, Marchant? Aye. Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Thanks, Jackie. Item six tonight is the council reports. I know that uh, council member Mr. Kling has a Metro Advisory reports. Bob? Uh, the Metro Advisory met <clears throat> May 12th. There were 32 in attendance and it was a Zoom meeting. Uh, the major discussion for the meeting was on stormwater management. We viewed the PowerPoint, Cattle Crossroads, Stormwater Management, the vision plan for Greater Des Moines and Central Iowa. And I sent a copy of that to each of you today to view at your own leisure. Uh, the four items presented were uh, really agreed upon by the communities. The Home Builder Association, HBA, and builders understand that this is going to be a different, different in each community. And each community is going to have to figure out the why in their, their separate communities. Emily Kessinger for Capital Crossroads said that we've met with many of the Metro city managers. And she said that change is hard and talking with some, it was clear who the champions are going to be. So the requirements are a little different. So there will be kind of a learning curve. 
Aaron Sittenden of DMAC said there was a design standard goal and we left it up to the communities on how they can achieve that goal. What was striking were that there were some cities that changed their baselines for the better, which was good. And Jennifer Wells from the Polk County Soil and Water uh, uh, Commission said they're working and putting together resources that will be useful for standard reporting. I also brought up the fact that we just, that the city of Indianola received a million dollar grant for our streetscape design and handling our stormwater. And there are several other communities that were pretty excited about that and asked me to send information uh, about this grant. Then our COVID-19 update, uh, Polk County has learned that the homeless population outside of Polk County is increasing and Polk County is working with the state to keep those individuals in their own communities because they're really concerned about their own resources, which everybody is. And Robert Palmer from the Abbott League of Cities said that we should not expect a heavy session of policy from the legislature over the next couple of months. The league will be sending out lots of information on funding for cities and the new federal bill, but there are lots of unknowns on the cost and revenue losses for the cities. And there was discussion if any cities at that time were thinking about developing plans for cities to reopen. And I explained that Indianola already had our plan developed and it would be in three phases. And I think we were may have been one of the first cities that really had a plan out there. So congratulations to the, to the uh, city and the staff because others didn't seem to have a plan at this time. Yeah, when this came out, but, but we did. So that was pretty much what the uh, Metro Advisory Committee did. So. I guess you mentioned that they spoke to the city manager. Did they talk to you, Ron? Oh, I've, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> they have, um, and they've, they've incorporated and have spoken to um, our public works department. Uh, but one of the things that we've shared with them is that we're going through that, the multi year stormwater master planning study, which they were very appreciative of. Um, and actually, I think Dave Muller is on um, as a participant in a Zoom uh, meeting for tonight. And one of the things that we've been talking about with Dave is coming back and presenting to the council where we're at with that that program. Because once once we're done with the, the study, then we start getting into some of the discussions from a policy level standpoint with the count, with the council about the stormwater uh, our stormwater codes. And actually, uh, Councilman Schroeder and I met with the resident earlier today about uh, flooding and stormwater. So everything's very timely and, and uh, the, the city's been um, pretty pretty ahead of the curve as it relates to stormwater with the master planning study that they've been doing. So kudos to you all. Very good. Any further questions for Mr. Kling? Thanks, Bob, for your report. Moving on to item 6B is consideration of a renomination of Jeremy Pribel to the Planning and Zoning Commission to serve from July 1, 2020 until June 30th, 2025. Motion to approve. Second. First and second. Any discussion? Jackie, please. Councilmember Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Thanks, Council. Jackie. Item seven is the mayor's report. Um, obviously, lots going on. Uh, just want to remind people that uh, despite the opening up, that we still do have some COVID-19 uh, growth going on in the county. Uh, so continue to use your social distancing as much as possible and wear a mask uh, whenever you and wherever you can. Uh, a little bit earlier today on the consent agenda, Council approved the work associated with the Iowa Great Places grant. Uh, just want to tip a hat to them. Uh, multiple letters of support ranging from Stacy Schoenbrand at the National Balloon Classic to Bob Lane at Simpson College and Art uh, at the community uh, schools. I was on that <laughs> appointment process uh, several years ago and so I know it is a, a very time consuming process and so want to thank those good people who are listed there. Uh, on the agenda and in the agenda on the proposal for your hard work there and certainly um, for, um, and I should have mentioned as well, um, Brenda Easter at the chamber uh, for their support in that process. So thank you to those who serve uh, on that committee and for moving that process forward uh, in that regard. Um, want to just thank quickly um, both the police department, Ryan Waller, 
uh, regarding parking around the square. A um, long time ago, several weeks ago rather, I reached out uh, to Supervisor DeCook and so Aaron DeCook needs applause as well, um, trying to get ahead of the parking issue around the square. Do recall that um, parking around the square is limited to three hours and uh, this is something not only uh, the city has begun to enforce, but certainly something that the persons uh, who operate and own businesses around the square appreciate as well. So just a, a quick shout out um, to those of you who might be watching uh, online uh, to make sure that if you're up on the square, please spend lots of money and support the businesses, uh, but do so in three hour increments if you would. Uh, speaking of raising a lot of money, I do want to say uh, a one more time thank you um, to the individuals who are involved in uh, Pay It Forward uh, Indianola. Um, thousands of dollars went into uh, small businesses here in Indianola. And again, thousands of dollars in gift cards went forward to frontline workers and those who are trying to make uh, this COVID situation just a little bit nicer or maybe a little sunnier for all of us. So um, thanks for that. It was a fortunate to participate in another food drive yesterday. I believe that's probably the last one, but there might be one more. And so the food banks uh, are, are well replenished. I would also be remiss, of course, if I did not say something about um, the tragic uh, murder of George Floyd um, to not only his family, but of course the countless persons uh, who have been impacted by his murder at the hands of uh, police officers up in Des Moines, I'm sorry, up in um, Minneapolis. Uh, we've seen a lot of violence associated with that, and rightfully so, people are quite angry. We've seen a lot of violence associated with that around the country, um, and as I made the slip earlier, up in Des Moines as well. Um, I received a number of calls uh, last night and text messages from persons concerned about the, um, about the restrictions that were being placed in Polk County um, yesterday. Uh, we do not have those in place uh, here in Warren County, certainly nor in Indianola. Um, but do be aware as city manager has talked a little bit earlier to us in the weekend uh, that our police department is not only trained well to address um, these racial issues uh, and also to be on the lookout for injustices as they might be related um, to race and minority status, uh, but they're also actively trained in that regard. And so um, if anytime anybody in the community has any fears uh, regarding that, I would encourage you to uh, reach out to one of your council persons or to myself, to the city manager. Um, and if none of them are good enough, certainly you can call the police department at the non-emergency line. Uh, and that number is 515-961-9400. Chief Button, as, long, as well as his leadership, and of course the officers uh, on the street are well aware of the intense situations and the, the concerns that people have. And so um, I just wanted to um, console people uh, who are a little bit on edge and also express my condolences um, to the, the Floyds and of course all the other incidences that we've had this spring. It seems to be kind of elevated and on a lot of people's uh, uh, radars in that regard. And so um, if any time the city of Indianola uh, can help you with those uh, feelings of fears or concerns, uh, please reach out to the city, your elected officials, uh, the city persons, or again, the Indianola Police Department um, in that regard. Um, there have been, again, a number of emails and calls that I've received. Um, I just wanted to let council know that I am looking at um, breathing some life again into the non-judicial human relations commissions, uh, which is an appointed commission um, by the mayor with approval from the council. Um, it is a commission that hasn't been alive uh, since I've been mayor in the six and a half years since I've been mayor. Um, I don't know that it was under Mayor Breslin or not. I would bow to some of the institutional memory uh, on the council regarding that, but I have a feeling it probably hasn't been. Uh, but I'm going to be looking into that and addressing some of those issues with those individuals who um, came to me. And if there's a feeling that uh, this non-judicial human relations commission can do good things in terms of uh, helping with some of those feelings in the community and again in Iowa and across the country as well, uh, I will do that. Any, any efforts would of course involve um, multiple diverse persons across the community 
um, would involve Simpson College, was also involved in school, school district as well. And so um, I may or I may not come to you with uh, nine nominations uh, in our July 1st meeting um, for that. So I just wanted to, to say that to council and, and let them know that I'll be um, taking a look at that. If any of you on council have any feelings one way or the other, um, please don't hesitate to let me know uh, in that regard. And the other, only other area that I wanna bring up uh, is that I want to provide to you an update on the entrepreneurialism and sustainability roundtable um, for the fiscal year of 2021 or 2020, which we're in right now. Uh, council allowed for a line item in the mayor's budget of $3,500 uh, to be spent um, towards a roundtable that addresses entrepreneurialism and sustainability. Um, that roundtable was initially planned to take place last fall. Uh, but given the fact that the scope of the roundtable has expanded a little bit, uh, and I've got a number of different persons who are interested in it as well, uh, it had been cooked back to the spring and of course now with COVID-19 uh, moving a little further back. Um, tentatively right now, I have scheduled um, in working with the Indian Oil Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Des Moines Partnership, a Launchpad uh, 65, Emerge at Simpson College and Warren County Economic Development Corporation uh, have a round table scheduled for June 25th, 26th, uh, somewhere in that time. I will certainly be sending uh, invitations out to each of you as uh, I get uh, this solidified. Uh, and for those of you who are not on the council, I will send out this proposal to you since you were not initially uh, voting on that uh, line item commitment of $3,500. I just wanted to see if there was any um, objection to having me move forward with that still in this fiscal year. Um, of course, it would be still in the same fiscal year, but it would be a few months later than the initial proposal. All right. Um, I will, again, to those of you who were not on council previously, uh, send that to you in a nutshell. Uh, I've been involved with uh, the Kauffman Foundation down in Kansas City uh, that looks at entrepreneurialism and, and building a entrepreneurial environment. Um, so uh, we will continue moving forward in that direction. Mayor, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. later, later on in the agenda under the city manager's report, there's an item for a special council meeting. Um, this is, we're in the last month of the fiscal year. Um, so anything that is being spent uh, for this fiscal year would have to go through the budget amendment um, that Andy's putting, or I'm sorry, I'm com combining two things. Um, we're setting up a special meeting at the end of this month to make sure we're paying bills. Anything else then, if it's carried over, would have to be subject to a budget amendment for the next fiscal year. So um, any information you can share, um, this, the sooner the better, we can make sure we've got all the logistics worked out for budgetary processes and whatnot. Great, thanks Ryan, yep, thanks for the update. Um, yeah, I'll certainly get that to you yet this week. We should be nailing down the speakers and the uh, format. Again, it's a little, it's actually easier now to do Zoom meetings than it is to in-person meetings, but um, kind of the entrepreneurial nature, we would like to have it in person, but uh, figuring out a space to have that and hopefully an entrepreneurial space as well. Um, figuring out a space to have that and maintaining some of the distancing uh, has remained a challenge. So thanks for that, Ryan. I will get that to you very soon. Anyone else, any questions on that? Very good. If not, we'll move on to public considerations. It is the meeting, I think, of uh, public hearings. We have a number of them and so um, a number of opportunities. Uh, as always, if you uh, are watching this at home and want to participate uh, you may call in. That call in number is 962-5240, area code 515, of course. Uh, you can call in uh, and you can be heard during these public hearings of which there's about five of them uh, this evening. And so uh, without further ado, we'll move right into uh, public hearing number one, um, which is a public hearing to determine if a nuisance exists at 505 West 2nd Avenue. And so at this time, uh, I would like to open this public hearing for comments. Mayor Charlie Sell here. I'm just trying to get the PowerPoint loaded up here. Thanks, Charlie.
projector warm up just a little bit more. Hey, Mayor, members of council, Charlie DeSell, uh, Community and Economic Development Director. Um, as the mayor noted, this is a, a request for a hearing on a nuisance to determine if a nuisance exists. Um, really quick, just to give you an idea where the property is, uh, 505 West 2nd Avenue is located right here um, on the screen. It is uh, roughly at the corner of Highway 92 slash 2nd Avenue in D Street. Quick rundown on the history here. On April 17th, our uh, zoning uh, building and zoning official did uh, allege that a violation of Chapter 51 of the Code of Ordinances uh, regarding junk and junk vehicles uh, was occurring on the property. On April 20th, uh, that was a Monday, a letter was sent by certified mail giving the property owner 14 days to abate the nuisance. On April 23rd, according to U.S. Postal Records, the certified mail was delivered to the property owner. On April 30th, uh, the property owner contacted the building and zoning official by phone stating his intentions to request a hearing. And then we did officially receive that request for hearing on May 7th. And as the council recall on May 18th, um, your last council meeting, we did set this hearing for June 1st. Um, there was some pictures uh, included in your packet. Um, we did take one additional picture this morning. Uh, excuse me, it was actually about this afternoon of the property. Um, you can see on the screen here above, there's no car parked in the driveway. You can see there is a, a junked vehicle sitting back here um, and then some other uh, random junk located throughout the property on there. So with that, um, after mm -hmm. I'm done presenting the facts here, the, the next appropriate course of action would be to allow for the property owner um, to state their case. Um, after that, uh, council can deliberate and find one of three options, um, essentially agreeing with staff that the nuisance does um, exist. Um, you can uh, find that the nuisance does not exist, or you can request to continue this hearing to the next council meeting, which will be 6 p.m. on Monday, June 15th. Um, so with that, if there's any questions on this of me, I would be happy to answer them. Um, two questions. One, was this initiated by like a neighbor complaint? Or yes, something? yes, okay. we, yeah, we received a complaint on this one. Um, it was also one that we had been kind of keeping an eye on from a staff level, um, what was happening as we would see uh, junk accumulating, it would take care of itself in a couple of days and then it was repeating. We finally did get a citizen complaint about that. So we then enacted on it. Okay. My second question is, are there always this many vehicles on the property that are stationary or there are that many vehicles that they come and go? Yeah, I don't, they're not always parked in, for long term on there. So the zoning code states that you can park in the front yard outside of a driveway as long as it's not there for more than 48 hours. So we've never been able to determine that one vehicle stayed there for longer than 48 hours as they have been moving. Okay. Any further questions for Charlie? Okay, Charlie, thank you. So my understanding the property owner has asked for this um, public hearing. Does the property owner want to speak at this time? We've received no calls. Okay. And no property owner either, I assume, Jackie. Yeah, and real quick, uh, for the record, we did notify the property owner of this hearing. He did indicate that he would attend, but I does not believe that he is in attendance. That's my assumption too, Charlie. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak to this during this public hearing? Jackie, I'll give about 20 seconds more and then we'll move on. So the point of reference, do, if no one speaks on his behalf, do we then make a decision regarding nuisance or do we postpone and 
you know, have the hearing later or what do we do? That's at the discretion of council. Obviously the public hearing was set for today. If you'd want to postpone to the next meeting, um, we can contact the property owner again and, and encourage them to attend. Yeah, he had a chance to yeah, exactly. I've been up for a long time. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Notified, notified. Right. Right. Okay. So we need a motion then. Anybody call? Let me let me close let me close this public hearing then. Uh, we'll move on to item 1B, which is determination of a nuisance for the property located at 505 West 2nd Avenue. I believe um, Mr. Dressel uh, gave you the three options available to you. I make a motion that we agree with staff and declare it a nuisance. Second. First and second. Any discussion to that? I would agree from looking at the pictures and, and stuff, I you know. He's had plenty of opportunities, or the property owner, I should say, he or she has had many opportunities to to take care of it, but it seems like it just keeps coming around. And since we have had a complaint, probably take care of that. I agree. What are the options for abatement, and have they been communicated to the property owner? Yeah, as part of the nuisance letter that we sent out, uh, that kind of covers all of that. I know Tim's communicated with the property owner as well, too, about exactly what needs to be cleaned up. Um, council's, I think, aware, you know, we'll, and one thing I guess I would encourage as part of the motion is to determine that number of days that they have now to abate it. I think we put that in your letter. I've recommended seven. If you want to go longer than that, that's, that's the, completely up to council. Um, but our next step then would be to take care of it if we don't get any compliance from the property owner we have the ability then to tow any junk vehicles off the property and then hire a contractor to clean up the property. As a point of discussion, I would be in favor of making it 14 rather than seven days, especially given that the property owner did not show up or call in. And I think we really want to make sure that the time is there and what's another lease, right? Right, and just give it a little more due diligence. Yeah. I, I would agree. Good. <clears throat> Part of the discussion, we do have a first and a second on the motion from Mr. Marchant. Councilmember Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Thanks, Council. Uh, moving on to item two is annexation request from John and Mary Peterson. Uh, another public hearing. So at this time, I'd like to open this public hearing on the request of Mr. and Mrs. Peterson for annexation into the city of Indianola. Moving around a lot here. Give me one second. <laughs> sure, Charlie. All right, mayors, members of council, uh, Charlie Sell, Community and Economic Development Director. Um, the re property that we have here requests to be annexed into the city. Um, we've been ongoing with this process with this uh, particular applicant and property owner for a few months now. Um, it is located on the northwest side of the city um, County Highway R63 here on the west side of it, Inwood on the north side, and then 110th Avenue, which then turns into Y Street within the city on the west side of it. Um, it is approximately 70 acres of land um, that is being requested to be annexed in, and the um, person requesting the annexation has indicated that this would be a residential subdivision uh, eventually if they approved. Wanted to show you this map here again. The area that we have outlined in the red is the area proposed to be annexed. As part of this process, we did encourage the applicant um, to touch base with the property owners directly to the west, as well as directly to the south to see if there was any um, anticipation of those properties being annexed in, in the future so we could kind of lump this all into one application. Um, those two properties, uh, they were looked at, uh, both property owners were approached and both property owners indicated they did not want to be annexed at this time. Um, I do bring that up because once we annex this piece right here, um, our current comp plan does not show any growth west of County Highway R63, which would, um, okay, doesn't show any growth west of R63, which would then take this piece here on the south side, um, makes it a little bit harder to annex that in in the future. The state does have with the voluntary annexation a rule where um, it's called the 80-20 rule, where as long as 80% of the land in an annexation application um, has asked for that annexation, we, the city, can bring another 20% of that land mass in without their consent. Um, I bring that up again because sometimes when you get into these rural farmsteads out here, 
uh, that have a residential value on them. When you're going from a county levy rate to a city levy rate, there's a lot of time, not too much of an appetite from those landowners to want to be annexed into the city. Uh, this particular piece of ground down here, um, it is about 80%, it's actually about 81% farmland and then about 19% single family. So by annexing this piece up here, we're not really creating a hindrance in future annexations for the city. Um, same thing with this one over here. We've got an abundance of ground to the north that's all in a growth priority area. Um, we're not too worried um, if we don't bring this piece in right now because, again, we can bring that in with some of the land up to the north. <clears throat> Did want to point out um, this particular request since uh, we've been reviewing this since February um, is brought on under our old comp plan since the new comp plan was just adopted uh, at your last council meeting. So. Uh, this applicant has been looking at this piece of ground based off the old comp plan. Old comp plan um, did actually have some uh, growth areas in there. They're a little bit different than new, uh, the new one, but it does show it's a moderate priority growth area. Um, you see the area right here, and I kind of zoomed in on it a little bit there. So again, the current comp plan does call for it. Also wanted to point out that even though not into effect, your new comp plan does show this as a high growth priority area. Um, so looking at this, um, again, I wanted to go over quickly on the future growth and how that, that would uh, be affected. Um, we did look at utilities. The Utility Board of Trustees did review this at its April 13th meeting. Um, as far as sanitary goes, um, there is an 18-inch sanitary sewer main that is located, let me get back to the map here, um, right here at uh, Y Street and uh, Euclid. There's also another sanitary sewer manhole located right here. Um, wanted to bring that up because this sanitary sewer right here can be fed by gravity. The one down here at the corner of Y and Euclid cannot. So if they, uh, the property owner does anticipate connecting to this one, it would create, uh, require a lift station to be placed there, which is just another asset that the city would own. We would review that as part of a subdivision process. But again, just as part of the annexation application, I think that's good to note. Utility Board of Trustees did review this. Um, they noted three things. This is not within their electrical territory. It's in with Mid-America's electrical territory. So uh, IME would not be providing electricity to it. Um, there is a 12 inch water main located at Euclid and Y Street. Um, they did note that that would be the responsibility of the developer to connect to that water main. And then um, fiber, um, the fiber infrastructure would have to be planned and developed into this area. Um, they did note that uh, their schedule right now is out for the next three years. So the soonest any fiber could be installed in this property would be in 2023. So with that, I think that goes over everything. Um, one other thing, I'm sorry, the comp plan does designate this area as low density residential. As part of the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation to council, they did recommend that the R, R, excuse me, the R1 zoning district uh, be placed on this property. Um, so the next action, if you do approve this annexation, would be to set the public hearing to then determine the zoning district. Um, that R1 zoning district does drive really well with what the comp plan states, both current and future. Um, and most of the land that is located west of Kenwood is zoned R1 currently. So it would kind of fit with the area out there. So with that, if there is any questions on this application, I would be happy to answer them. Charlie, are there any issues with uh, easements getting things to the property, whether it be water, sewer, whatever, are there any issues? No, I mean, the, the sewer was the biggest one. Again, they tried to get, uh, they discussed with this landowner here to get a sewer easement to connect to this manhole right here, just because it would be more economical for them. Um, this landowner was not interested in giving any easements. So that's it. The other ones, I mean, we can get down there through existing right away that the uh, county owns in some cases, but if we do annex it in its city right away, but uh, there, there's no problem getting to any of those manholes via right away. I, my question was, uh, I guess it was developed because of the fact we could get, what, 20% more acres? Yep. So we could get another 14 acres uh, forced annexation, mm -hmm. not voluntary. And if we needed to do something with utilities, I'd be inclined to yeah. pursue that. But so we, need to do it. we looked at that and that exact point with the Planning Commission, we actually looked at this property right here and this property right here, which we could have brought both of them in under that 20%. Um, ultimately, the Planning Commission decided not to make that a recommendation. As I mentioned before, we have an abundance of ground to the north that right. we can bring those in under. But again, yeah, these two aren't going to really hold up any potential easements that I think the developer would need to get to. Okay. And I'm not sure that 
I want to go down that road of enforcement. I, mean, I know we can, but it doesn't mean we have. We no. should. You know, well, if we needed to get utilities right. there, and that was the only way, that's that was the reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. But if that was the only way, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it would be. And from my standpoint, I think that, that it, it's really in place and the state code actually says why it's in place. So you're not creating jagged city boundaries and you're not creating islands. It's just a way for you to, to be able to annex land appropriately. So again, like I said, in this one, we have so much ground to the north that we can bring those in next time. Further questions for Charlie? Jackie, I did hear the phone ring. Was that somebody who wanted to speak? No, it wasn't. Okay. For the questions for Charlie, discussion points. If not, I will close this public hearing at this time and move to a resolution approving a request from John F. and Mary Helen Peterson for annexation of the city of Indianola. Move to approve a resolution uh, request for John F. and Mary Helen Peterson for annexation into the city of Indianola. Second. Second. Any discussion on that? Thank you, gentlemen. Jackie? Council Member Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Hewland? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Very good. Per Mr. Dishel's comments then, uh, we need to have a resolution setting a public hearing for July 6, 2020 to establish the zoning district boundaries regarding the request from John F. and Mary Helen uh, Peterson for annexation in the city of Indianola. Move to approve. Second. First and second. Jackie? Council Member Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Hewland? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Thanks, Jackie. Moving on to item three under the old business is the rezoning request from M2 General Industrial Zoning District to the R4 Multiple Family uh, Zoning District. Another public hearing associated with this. So at this time, I'd like to open a public hearing on a rezoning from M2 General Industrial Zoning District to the R4 Multiple Family Residential Zoning District. And Charlie, you're having a busy night. The floor is yours. It's only just begun. Um, yeah, real quick on this one, uh, as the mayor mentioned, this is a rezoning request from the M2 Zoning District to the R4 Multiple Family Zoning District. Um, this is to facilitate a proposed development of a two-story 50 unit apartment complex for households 55 years of age and older. Um, it is worth noting that on March 9th of this year, the applicant did host a neighborhood meeting at the Indian Oil YMCA uh, that was attended by about 12 to 15 residents uh, who live out in this area. Um, on the screen here above, you can see the area that they're looking at. It's a very um, thin rectangular piece um, located just north of where the Cadian proposal um, that council reviewed a couple times last year and again this January. Uh, is located along North Ninth here. Um, we did want to note, uh, while the comprehensive plan does plan this area as light industrial, um, that should be noted that the boundary line between the mixed residential and the light industrial is located on the south boundary uh, of this property. Uh, and the future land use map is a policy guide whose boundaries are not meant to be exact. Um, the applicant did make a note in their application that this site, if used for a multifamily site, uh, could serve as an appropriate transition from the residential uses to the south to the industrial uses to the north. And then on the screen here above, if you can see it, uh, the proposed site plan that we have seen so far as part of this rezoning application, this is not an official submittal on the site plan, but just give you a good concept uh, of what that was like. Um, Mayor, I do know that both Barry Accountus and then Nick with the Woda Cooper companies are on Zoom here, so um, I'm sure they'll want to speak and, and uh, discuss their project, but if there's any other questions of me uh, before we move on, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions for Charlie, and I'll take them in order then, uh, starting with Nick and then Barry, but any questions from Council right now for Charlie? Here, now, see, now, Nick, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, did Charlie happen to share the uh, the package that was prepared for the meeting with planning and uh, zoning last month that provided some of the three D renderings for this project? Just out of curiosity. The the only thing that we submitted was the um, application that we got from on the rezoning. So I don't think there was any actual renderings of okay. the buildings. 
And if you have those, I think you should be able to share your screen. Sure. Okay. Um, so we're with the Water Cooper Companies, and we're a national developer of uh, multifamily housing. And, and what we're proposing here is a 50 unit mixed income senior development. Uh, some of the units will be offered at market rate. Some of them will be offered at sort of a, a, a 80% AMI, which is a fairly high income level. And a few more would be offered at a uh, lower level targeted to seniors that are more on social security or like a, a, a government pension, something of that nature. Um, we have applied to the Iowa Finance Authority for uh, tax credit financing for this project. Uh, we applied back in March uh, we should be receiving a determination of whether we were successful in August. And if we were, uh, we will be looking at starting this project the uh, following spring with about uh, a one year construction period. Uh, so we'd be looking at maybe summer of uh, 2022 that this would be ready to be placed in service. Um, I think we've got a very thoughtfully designed site plan here and um, Barry is free to jump in, but we have done, a, a, I think, a pretty good job of reaching out to the community to solicit support and uh, field any questions or concerns folks have had and, and done a good job addressing that um, as we move forward through this process. Uh, so if Barry wants to say anything, uh, he's welcome to. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions that council may have. Any questions for Nick, council? Very good. Barry, anything to add? Oh, I had to unmute myself, Mayor. Apologies for that. Worries. And uh, I do apologize for not uh, getting the elevations or the renderings uh, to Charlie and the staff. Um, on, that, that's on me. Now, as, as Nick said, we, uh, we held a public or uh, a neighborhood meeting at the Y right before the world came to an end and um, had some very good feedback. Uh, the, the Neighborhood Association, the unofficial uh, head of the association was there and some other folks. I think uh, one of the city councilmen was actually in the room as well, maybe a couple of them. But um, we, we, we try to show in the most transparent, transparent manner that we can that what we want to do is bring a fantastic asset to an already terrific neighborhood. Uh, the two-story um, elevator building, fully accessible, to, to seniors is uh, right in our wheelhouse. Uh, of our 300 properties, I'm gonna say at least a third, maybe more, are these types of properties. We bring in a, uh, a management company that is, is our own, Woda Managed Real Estate. They will be on site as well as, as maintenance uh, personnel and staff. And um, we believe we're, we're creating a um, kind of a good community where we go to do these things and we just, it might sound cliche, but we want to be a good neighbor. Um, and uh, that's what I have, Mayor. Thank you, Barry. Appreciate that. Uh, any questions for Barry, Council? No questions, but I do, do have a comment. Council Person Parker and I attended that meeting that Barry had with the local residents, and I didn't see any complaints. Uh, from any of them. I thought there was great dialogue in the room that night. And at the end of it, I walked away uh, feeling real good about the project. And I felt like the people that came from the surrounding neighborhood felt like they got the information they needed. So great job that night, Barry. Thank you. Yes, I would agree. Um, and then too, I just received a text uh, thanking whoever mowed and uh, Got the tall grass down, and you can see the the uh, public hearing sign. So <laughs> I don't know if that was you guys or not, but uh, this, this resident was thankful for that. So very good. I would second what council and uh, both councilmen have said. Barry and Nick, thank you for your investment uh, in Indianola. We're pleased that uh, you picked us. So uh, thank you for uh, jumping through the hoops that we require. Appreciate that. No problem at all. Any further questions in this public hearing at this point? Comments? We didn't receive any. Very good, thanks for the update, Jackie. Uh, hearing none and seeing none, uh, we will close this public hearing and move on to item 3B, which is first consideration of ordinance, approving a rezoning from M2 General Industrial Zoning District to the R4 multiple family, i.e. residential zoning district. Motion to approve. Second. Second. The first and the second. Any further discussion? Jackie, please. 
Council Member Hewland? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Thanks, Council. Thanks, Nick and Barry, for coming. Uh, you're welcome to stay, but I understand if Monday night football or something is calling. Don't, You've got some ice cream. Don't we wish. That would be all right. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Looking forward to working with you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Barry. I'm uh, moving on to uh, item four of the proposed development plan and rezoning from R3 mixed residential zoning district to R5 plan residential uh, district. Uh, at this time, I'd like to open this public hearing on proposed development plan and rezoning from R3 mixed residential zoning district to R5 plan residential district. Uh, Charlie is at the microphone. I do know that Mr. Charlton uh, is there as well. Tom, welcome. We'll have you up to the podium in just a few moments. Charlie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just really quick, want to introduce this item uh, and go over uh, some of the facts uh, pertaining to it. Uh, and see the property that uh, is being evaluated here, um, outlined in the red here. You have Hillcrest, East Hillcrest, uh, right here. Um, Scenic Valley Avenue currently stubbed in on the west side, and again here on the east side as it goes into the Quail Meadows subdivision. Uh, Council will recall that a preliminary plat for the Quail Meadows both three and four subdivision uh, just to the north of this property was approved late last year. Um, and you also have 7th, uh, or excuse me, 7th Street um, that currently intersects with Hillcrest. Uh, and you'll see on this development that it does propose taking that north. Quickly wanted to go over the statement of intent. I'm not going to read the whole statement of intent, but I just do want to focus on the first sentence for the R5 plan residence district. Um, it is the intent of this district to permit innovative design concepts to be used for, excuse me, to be used in residential development where a deviation from <clears throat> conventional layout and development practices would result in a more appropriate use of land. So what that says um, from, from what it is in, we, the city of Indianola calls it a PRD. I'll commonly refer to these as PUDs because that's what most cities refer to these as, as PUDs, it's a planned unit development. Um, but these are, it's a concept that is used by cities, um, just about every city in the metro that I could look up today um, when looking through their zoning ordinance that they use um, and something that is used nationwide. Essentially what the commissioner and, and the council is charged at looking at here is, does this fit within our comp plan? And essentially what you do is you create a standalone zoning district for this particular piece of property while paying attention to some of the other regulations that we do have in effect. So when we're looking at the R5 plan residence district, there's three requirements that I have here on the screen. Um, first of all, it talks about yards, area, and height. It states that variations in yard requirements, and I underline the yard requirements, lot area and height required in the R3 district may be approved for the planned residence district. Then it says, however, the minimum wards around the boundaries of the R5 shall not be less than that required of the R3 district. So when I was looking at this uh, from a standpoint, when uh, my interpretation on this was, we talk about yard requirements here, we talk about wards down here, two different words. The yard requirements typically are lot sizes, lot area, does include setbacks in a lot of the, uh, instances as well, and then lot widths where wards to me, uh, I, I think the yard requirements is meant to be a more broad interpretation of those requirements. Wards narrows it down a little bit more to aesthetical things such as setbacks, um, things like that. Um, typically lot width and lot size requirements are more of a density control tool where generally setbacks are for aesthetics. They're also for fire safety and stuff like that. Um, but uh, aesthetics brings out that. So my interpretation on that is again, the yard requirements looks at everything the wards are just talking about the setbacks on that. Density, it also talks about that and that the density of anything that we're looking at in an R5 district cannot be more than what would be permitted in the R3 district. Um, it does state when you compute density that you look at the piece of ground as a total, what that number of acres is, and then figure out how many lots you could get out of that based off that minimum lot size of 7,200 square feet that's required in the R3 district. When you do that on this particular piece of property, um, you could get 107 lots out of that 17.72 acres, which is a density of about 6.05 units per acre. And it's worth noting that this development does propose 71 lots, which is about just a tad over four units per acre. And then last one on the open space, it says plan residence district shall take into consideration 
the need for open space. So it's a shall take into consideration. Um, we worked with a developer on this one. Uh, it was uh, earlier this winter, um, I believe earlier in this year when we met with them. We did talk about parks initially. However, the comp plan that was in effect at the time, and again, that's our old comp plan, didn't show any park plan for this area. So they did take into consideration what the comp plan said, but again, the comp plan didn't note any parks in this area. However, it should be noted, and if I can go back to the screen here above, um, there is an overall concept for the Summercrest Hills, um, which does show that there would be a planned park somewhere in this area right here. So while this particular development doesn't show it, the overall concept for Summercrest Hills does show some park land uh, being placed up here. And then when we move forward with the new comp plan, the new comp plan also does show a park up in this area. So any further development of summer crest hills up in this area, uh, we would wanna go through a uh, look at parks on that. And again, as council's aware, we're in the process of uh, getting quotes right now for an update of our zoning ordinance, which presumably um, if approved, would include a parkland education ordinance because that's something that's heavily discussed in our comp plan. So hoping that that all kind of jives up together that we would get there eventually, but <laughs> wanted to point out at least on the parkland consideration that that's how that was uh, taken care of on that. Um, wanted to show the comp plan designation. Again, this is the existing comp plan here. It does show for uh, this area here, it does show high density residential and then medium density residential right here. Comp plan on that actually shows for higher density rates than is being proposed by this subdivision. And then lastly, wanted to show, so Summercrest Hills, uh, for those who have been on council um, for some time here and, and those who lived in the community for a while, this has been a kind of a 10 year uh, development that's been ongoing for quite some time. So there's been three different preliminary plats for this area of Summercrest Hills. First one was in 2010, you'll see right here. Here is East Trail Ridge uh, right there. And it shows again, the connection being made between where I pointed out on that last slide that it's currently stubbed in here um, on the east side and on the west side. So it shows that connection being made on the 2010 preliminary plat. Again, just another reiteration of that in 2013, this is really hard to read and I apologize, it's just how our uh, system scanned this in. Pretty much the same exact concept, uh, the 2013 preliminary plat was a little bit different for in the area by the Y. And then lastly in 2015, again, showing that road going through, connecting that there. Wanted to point that out again, because those two stubs are currently located right there. They're located right there because that is what the overall concept has called for for many years now. Um, this development taking Trail Ridge and punching it through meets that concept and what has been planned for for some time. So with that, I think that sums up everything I had. There was a lot of stuff as well in the staff report. And um, I know there are a few people on the Zoom call here representing the applicant. Um, I think everybody that's left over that's outside of our normal staff that is on their mayor um, would be involved in this. So I'll uh, just remind you of that. And if there's any questions of me, I would be happy to answer them. A quick question. Can you repeat what you said, the differences in the units per acre? Yeah. So what, what they can develop up to uh, would be that 107 lots on this property based off how that's calculated. And that is 6.05 units per acre. And that's under the R3? Yes. And that's, again, the way that that requirement reads is that you take in everything. It's done on a gross basis. You don't net out roads and stuff like that. That's a little bit more difficult to do. Um, but this is being developed at 71 lots are 4.01 units per acre. And do the, does the R3 to R5 have to be voted on at the same, is, is it all one package? Yes. It, it can't yes. be split out that maybe we think it's okay to go R5, but not approve this plan? This no, so the R5 requires that you submit a development plan with oh, okay. it. So okay. essentially, you're looking, you're almost, again, I mentioned this earlier, you're somewhat creating your own right. zoning district regulations for this right. particular piece of property. Okay. So yeah, without a plan in place, there's nothing for there's us no to enforce. Okay. Yeah. Further questions for Charlie Council? Charlie, I'm going to turn it over to um, those folks who want to talk. If you could, at the end of this, um, come back. Uh, you wrote an excellent memo uh, here, but uh, you make a couple of different recommendations on page 170 of the packet. 
uh, page five of your actual presentation there. I'm gonna circle back around after everybody else talks and, and, and ask you a couple questions about that. So I'll just give you that, that quick heads up there. Um, thank you for your uh, good presentation there. Um, Tom, do you wanna speak at this time or would you prefer to wait? Myra, I love to talk. <laughs> um, my name is Tom Charlton, 611 East Scenic Valley Avenue here in Indianola. And if it's all right with you, I'll take this mask down because it's fogging up my glasses. <laughs> and I haven't been exposed. I've been home. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and, and council people, for this opportunity to speak with you. On behalf of the 52 residents, immediate residents of this proposed development, uh, who signed a letter of discontent with the plan uh, that was presented to the May 9 meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, with respect to your position and time, I don't want to read this whole letter that I did email to you. And I know most of you um, responded to it, so I hope you all got it, had a chance to read it. But there are a few points that I, I do want to highlight. Um, we, we do appreciate um, and um, respect that uh, the, the plan for residential housing uh, is a significant opportunity to further promote Indianola as a great place to live. Um, and we support that growth in Indianola with affordable housing uh, that is consistent and compatible with uh, the develop neighboring developments and comply with the zoning codes that we have in place. Um, but there are a few issues that we see with this, and I'd like to bring those to your attention. Um, the current code uh, that Charlie talked about, uh, the R3 to R5, uh, does require that the lots that are on the perimeter of that new area be 60 feet wide. That's the minimum for R3. Well, they're not. And that was brought up to the builder's attention. And he said, if we have to do that, we're, that can't work for us. We can't fit as many lots in as we want. And his final proposed plan has those perimeter lots still at 54 feet, most of them. So that's in violation of the zoning code as it stands today. Um, in addition, the interior lots, uh, the ones between the outside ones, um, I believe are five feet from the property line on the sides. Our current zoning code calls for eight feet. So that's in violation. It, it's a problem for the builder, any builder here, and as you have seen, a number of them have looked at it. This is a long, narrow parcel. And to fit roads and houses in there that meet the code and still be able to get enough lots to build enough houses to make it financially feasible is a challenge. And so the, the way it exists today, though, it's still not in compliance with the code. Um, as uh, Charlie said in the statement of intent in the codes, it says to consider the establishment of green space or a park. Well, and as you heard, the builder considered it, but decided not to do it. The nearest park is a little over two miles away. It also says that the home should be consistent with, among other things, the neighboring communities, neighboring homes. And the prices that the builder has told us he was going to charge for these homes is considerably lower than on either the west or the east side. Um, it was noted in the last Planning and Zoning Commission meeting that the Zoning Commission doesn't have the authority to change the zoning codes. There's a different process for that. Um, and as a matter of fact, Joe Butler said, if we approve this, we don't have a leg to stand on if somebody comes to us again and says, well, we wanna make changes similar to that. You do it for one, are you prepared to do it for all? Um, and so with, with all of that in mind, should you decide to vote for approving it, we have a small compromise that we would like to suggest. Charlie, can you go back to that one with the map that shows the, the road going through? You, this one right here. 
John. Yeah, which, is, which one is the proposed? This is an old rendition of the function plot. I can pull the. Okay, well, this will work. Okay. This will work on this. This is the proposed road that goes through connecting um, uh, uh, Quail Ridge, Quail Meadow oh, to Scenic Valley on this side. I live there. You think I know what it's called? <laughs> um, and the proposal has a road going up and down and it's one across. Well, our proposal is, as Charlie said, this uh, East, East Trail, Trail Ridge, Trail Ridge, Trail Ridge, Trail Ridge. Yeah. Yeah is proposed to come through the year anyway and that road going up the west side would connect to it our thinking is that short piece of road that get, could be put in that comes out right behind the northeast corner of the country in and suites if you're familiar with that area that would obviate the need for this road connecting these two existing subdivisions and greatly reduce the traffic through here. Anybody here wanting to go north for work for whatever reason would either have to go down the hill crest and over it up or through here past the Y, around the bend, uh, past the medical centers and over to Casey's. Um, so as a thought, just a proposal, um, if that were to happen, if we could extend that short piece of road um, behind the hotel and hook up, it would eliminate the need for connecting the neighborhoods and give DR Horton the opportunity to put some more lots in there and put up more houses. So that, that's our thought. So at this point, we, we would like to ask you uh, to remain steadfast in your commitment to the, the zoning rules that we have uh, and require developer compliance. Um, and that's all I have to say about that. Questions? Thoughts? Comments? Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tom. Appreciate you coming in. Uh, Mr. Peterson, I noticed you've been in the back there as well. Wayne, I don't know if you want to talk or not, but feel free to step up to the mic if you'd like to. I think Tom has said everything that uh, that I would uh, speak to, and uh, we ask that the city council look at it, consider that suggestion on uh, that cross street, and uh, it's really served no. Uh, I mean, it could duplicate uh, entrance, access, egress out of that area to a more so so community. Go north anyway. so, right. so I have anything to say. Okay, Wayne. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, I do note that uh, Seth Moulton, as well as Brandon Stubbs, are on. Um, we'll take them in alphabetical order, starting with Seth. Uh, Seth, if you would like to speak to this, um, feel free at this time. Okay. Can you guys hear me? We can, yes. Sorry, I'm in the best office I could find uh, in my truck, in my driveway, at my house. So, <laughs> tough to get the kids to quiet down before bedtime. So, um, one, I appreciate the council's consideration for our uh, development here in Indianola. Um, I definitely understand the comments that are being uh, brought forth from the uh, neighbors around. Um, and we definitely can take that into consideration because obviously we want to be a good neighbor and we want to. Uh, bring a lot of really good neighbors to the community. Um, to speak in regards to the side yard setbacks, um, obviously going to a five foot wide side yard setback, um, that is more in common with what we do in every other city uh, in the Des Moines Metro with having a five foot side yard setback. Now, in regards to the 54 foot lots that uh, abut up to the neighbor's property, uh, the homes that we're proposing to build in this area um, range from anywhere from 34 to 39 feet in width, um, which obviously if you put that on a 54 foot lot, uh, the 39 footers would leave a seven and seven side yard setback, um, which is um, really more lines with what you would see in like an R1 almost uh, type setback where you have seven and eight or an R2 
excuse me. So, um, and then on top of that, we do have a few houses plans that are a 30 foot plan. That's um, same thing. If we put a third car garage in those, you'd be looking at a 40 foot wide house. And again, you'd have that seven and seven. So, uh, excuse me, my math was a little bit off. If you did a 39 foot house, you'd have a 15 foot setback of seven and a half and seven and a half or seven foot on one side and eight foot on the other side. Um, in regards to um, uh, the homes uh, that we're proposing for this area um, and price points, I mean, yes, we're definitely sensitive to uh, uh, our neighbors. Um, what we are doing, though, we want to build to what the market is asking for. Uh, we look at this piece like it is a great opportunity to bring a lot of uh, uh, first and second time home, home buyers to the neighborhood, uh, to Indianola in general. Um, right now, uh, if you look at almost any community in the Des Moines Metro, uh, we are extremely short on affordable housing. And I don't mean affordable housing like 60 and, and $70,000 houses that you would see in like a downtown Des Moines uh, area. Um, we're talking a shortage of houses that are 250 to $300,000. And even right now, if you look at the Indianola markets, I believe there's right around 40 houses only for sale in all of Indianola under $300,000 which um, is kind of a double-edged sword. It's great because you, it generally drives up property values when you have a smaller supply of homes. But on the flip side, it's also becomes less attainable for new families to come to the community. And I mean, of all times with COVID and uh, the situations that we're dealing with, we have seen people trying to get out of heavily populated areas and try and get to affordable areas with great schools with less density. And honestly, we look at this project like this is gonna be a great fit for Indianola. And um, again, we, we appreciate the neighbor's concerns. Um, you know, obviously putting townhomes in, in this piece and having an extra 35, 40 units is only going to one, drive a price point down um, if you were to stick with that R3 zoning uh, average unit. But also it's, a lot of times in your town situations, you aren't bringing your young families to the communities, which is what we're trying to drive. So uh, with that, um, if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm here to answer. So we appreciate uh, the consideration and, um, and uh, the opportunity to get a chance to build in your great community. So. Thank you, Seth. Appreciate it. Like your office, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Any, any questions for Mr. Moulton, council? I guess the only question I have is, so you mentioned you would be amenable to the adding to what the um, the neighbors just brought forward with, with what Tom said. Is that, did I catch that right in the very beginning? Uh, uh, no, so um, are, you, are, uh, are you referring to the road being added in? Yeah, that, that was my question. I, I, I don't know personally anything about that. I haven't seen it. And uh, honestly, I would defer to engineers on that. And obviously we'd have to look at costs and, and what that does to the lot layouts. I, um, like I said, I don't, I, I, that's the first I've heard about that. So um, I'm more speaking to the housing and what we want to bring to the community. So I would, I would defer to Brandon Stubbs on that, our engineer. Okay. Seth, it's Gwen Schroeder with Ward 3. The question I, I have, I appreciate the efforts to bring in young families, welcoming them to Indianola, into an area with good schools, less density. But my concern about this development is the density. I, it's a, more dense than what we are familiar with. So I think you've already answered it. I'm sure I know this is, you know, way into it. Is there anything at all we can do about the density? I mean, there are traffic concerns, the density as I realize you have to have so many units to be profitable. I realize the number of units is decreased from what it, you know, could have been, but that's my issue with this whole thing is the, the size of the frontage, the, the frontage of the lot. Uh, yeah, I appreciate your, your question. Um, I would say, uh, yeah, obviously we have to make sure that numbers work. Um, when it comes to frontages, if um, a, a lot of times the way these streetscapes will work, if we were to add five feet to each lot, one that does not change the home that we're going to put on that lot, it's going to be the same house. Um, it'll just have a little bit more frontage, but a lot of times the density uh, you might be affecting it by 
two or three houses on a, a long run of streets. So it, it, it ends up, it sounds like, it, it sounds like a good idea, but sometimes when you lose those two or three lots and ability, a lot of times that's your ability to make, um, the numbers work, unfortunately. And again, when, um, when you look at these communities that are really now all over the Metro with the PUDs and the, the five foot setbacks, um, the four lots an acre density. Um, if you go drive through these communities and all these different cities, and it's not just us building them, it's really um, pretty much a majority of the over half of the homes that are being built right now in the Des Moines Metro are in some form of a PUD. Um, you walk, you go through these neighborhoods, and, uh, they look excellent, honestly. Um, and again, if we're sitting there building um, on a 54 foot wide lot, a 39 foot house, uh, you're going to end up with 15 feet uh, still in between the two houses. Just like if you were to build on a 70 foot lot with a 55 foot wide plan. So mm -hmm. the streetscape ends up looking the same. And like I said, uh, the density just allows us to be able to come in there and, and build affordable housing and uh, make the numbers work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions currently for Seth? I have a question, but it's probably a Charlie question. I'm pretty going to be later. Yeah. Bob, uh, yeah, let me, let, let me wait for Charlie to come back around if you would, please. Um, Mr. Stubbs, would you like to weigh in? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't have uh, much to add to what Seth said. If you guys had any engineering questions, I'd be happy to answer those, but I think Seth has it covered pretty well. Very good, Brandon. Thank you. Any further questions for either gentleman or Tom, Council? I have a question, but it's not specific to this particular proposal. Okay. To what degree can we or should we consider trails to be linear parks and look at that as part of the green space or suggestions for putting these things in with development, connecting to existing trail systems, et cetera? I, I mean, our comp plan, it, we, we do show trails in our comp plan. We have a trails plan uh, for that. We, I, I think when we're looking at parkland, throughout our comp plan, our new comp plan and our previous comp plan, we don't incorporate trails into that number. Um, you'll recall, if you look through what the commission was debating back and forth on the distance that everybody has from a park, um, they were debating a quarter mile versus a half mile, but the trails were never a part of that in the comp plan. So I, and I'm looking to Doug here a little bit, I would say general practices, you don't include trails um, in those as linear parks, but yeah. But going back to that, I mean, the Planning Commission um, through their an hour and a half of deliberation on this back in April did bring up the fact that this is close to a trail and that there is that uh, type of facility there. Um, they also brought up the Y as well too, but obviously that's not a public uh, facility, it's a membership driven facility. So does that make sense? I know I'm probably yeah, rambled I, a little I'm bit there, but. Trying to work out if when we're looking at making new developments, if that is something that can be considered as in our park yeah. space. Yeah, I mean, I think it's definitely an asset, um, and I believe teach their own on that that aspect. But you know, with developments that we have going forward now, we've driven home the point of making trail connections when we can to those. So, a lot of it's going to come into. Charlie mentioned. I think we've done a really good job explaining and educating the community on the importance of the comp plan and how the comp plan should drive a lot of the policy decisions from the council. Um, as it's reflective of the community's voice of what the future holds. So we're in this interesting time frame where we have now have a new comp plan, but we had a, no a number of developments come in. So the comp plan gives us guidance. The guidance then dictates the code. So long, long term, that's where the importance of going through the zoning code updates to incorporate the parkland dedication, where a lot of that's going to be defined, what, what a trail is and how that's, what's classified as a park. Uh, and how that's calculated in as part of meeting the comp plan goals. So that's yet to come. 
but right now it's those two plans are serving as the best best guidance that we have. And please note when I'm talking about this, I'm not talking about oh, it's a ten foot wide sidewalk right. that is a trail. I'm talking about something along the lines of Great Western or Somerset Trail where right. we do have the trees, we do have the green space, and therefore it is much more. Yeah. It, I mean, your comments are, are perfectly timed because just this morning we were talking to a business owner who was talking about how do we get a trail from uh, the Jerry Kelly extension up Buxton to his, his business on the square. And we talked very much about what you talked about, how these do count as park space and, and is calculated towards that. So um, Charlie and I've talked about this a number of times with our team members uh, internally during staff meetings that the process to now start uh, the, to now start the process to update the zoning codes now that we have the comp plan in place cannot happen fast enough for these very reasons. Did you have something to follow? Charlie, do you want to step up? Yeah. I had a question. Uh, compatibility requirement, requirement please. Uh, can you address that? Kind of yeah. Compatibility of the house. Yeah. When when you're looking at compatibility, um, any interpretation on that is going to really be, you know, residential to commercial to industrial sort of uh, compatibility. Excuse me. Um, a few things on that. We're never looking at what lot values potentially would be as part of development because sometimes that can be a little bit fluid as you move on through the process. Um, there, there's probably also a lot of things that um, just are not appropriate when doing that either. So. Uh, on this particular one, though, you've got you've got some townhomes on the west side. You've got uh, some senior citizen facilities, very high dense um, senior citizen facilities on the west side. You would have this somewhat dense subdivision at four units per acre. Then transitioning over to Quail Meadows, which is you have to look back. I think Quail Meadows is about 2.74 units per acre. And then if you go north to where Phil Sager's uh, developing um, the next uh, houses up there, that's just a tad under two units per acre. So the, you've got single family out here, it, you know, single family is compatible with single family. Yeah, sure, there might be some different price points, um, but the density is kind of getting less as you move out from that area. Does that make sense? Yep, yep, okay. yep. While, you're, while you're up there, uh, <laughs> I wanna see if I've got some understandings correctly. Uh, one is by going to an R5, that gives some latitude in, in developments with uh, codes that are in place. Correct. Therefore, uh, there really, it really is no code violation with this particular project because uh, care has been taken in the planning by your office and uh, the prospective builders to set this up. In place. Is that yeah, correct. Uh, the biggest thing comes down to is that interpretation of the wards around the boundary of the subdivision. As I said, my interpretation on that was it was more setbacks for aesthetic reasons when we're discussing the wards. Now, the recommendation I had to the Planning Commission did recommend going to a 72,000 or excuse me, 7,200 square foot minimum lot size around the boundaries. Reason I had that in there was because, I, and I'm trying to remember, there was a number of lots along the boundary that all currently met 7,200. They had to make an adjustment on what would be the east side of the development on a few lots. And that's, I think, essentially where they lost one or two lots in doing that. But when we looked at that and reviewed it, we knew, okay, you're probably gonna lose one lot. You can still kind of meet that intent of the R3 zoning district. So you have that compatibility going down. So there was a recommendation on there to go to the 7,200 square feet, which obviously the developer agreed with did and the commission made that as part of their recommendation. But in, in reading Tom's letter and some of the email exchanges that you provided us, uh, number one is I want to reiterate the fact that the new comprehensive plan is not in place. Yes. And even if it were, it shall take into consideration, not that you have to do it. Yes. Um, secondly, the uh, it appears to me that the R5 creates the best possible way to use this particular piece of property. Um, otherwise, in my opinion, otherwise you're looking at two, three, four, five, maybe apartment buildings. Yeah. That go in there. And, and I think that's a good point reflective on this uh, reiteration here of the um, preliminary plat from 2015. So the property that we're looking at, if I can kind of trace it out, is right here. You'll see that they did plan for some single family here and then some large lots right here, which would be obviously apartment type buildings because to get another road in through here, 
and to kind of swing down and get some smaller lot sizes for single family while keeping the R3 zoning regulations just are not feasible on yeah. this piece of property. So that's why that preliminary plat um, showed those apartment buildings being there. Okay. I, I also heard the word precedent being set and there actually is a precedent not being set by this R5, is that correct? Um, I mean, I think when you look at that, you know, going forward, um, if we see a similar piece of ground and has similar stuff on it, is there a presence being set? Possibly. But again, we look at every piece of ground differently. Every piece of ground has different elevations on it, has different contours of it. It has different water features on it, things like that. So it's not um, that it not, might not happen. Yeah. It just doesn't have to yeah. happen because one particular piece of ground fits yeah. it. Another that's uh, maybe not as attractively laid out doesn't necessarily fall into the category that you automatically do it just because yes. you've done. Yeah, that's that's and, the point. And you know, if, if we were looking at say a, a quarter quarter section of ground, which is 40 acres, um, you have a lot more flexibility to put a road network in there, meet those minimum lot sizes on that than you are on a piece of ground that's you know whittled down to about I think it's about 450 feet wide on this particular one. So there's just some challenges with this based off what's left of developable ground. So that, that leads to a lot of that. But again, well, no, I don't think it sets precedence because we look at everything individually. Isn't that what the whole idea of what the PUD is? Yes. Is to right. take everyone separately. Yeah, yeah. just really quick. Uh, you know, I've heard the, the term precedence thrown out quite a bit when, when it comes to zoning. And it's really important to understand that zoning is on a case by case basis. So when you look at zoning, you're talking about land and the shape of the land and the different, the different features of land. So Charlie mentioned the different contours. Um, if we're talking about flat ground, that's all the same size, no contours, everything the same, then yes, then you're talking about precedent. But when you look at zoning, zoning is case by case basis. So you have to look at the specifics of the lot lines, everything that plays into that, the neighboring properties even factors into that. So uh, while precedent is being thrown out and it has been stated, you don't create a precedence because this is a uniquely shaped lot. This has different features. And as, as Charlie pointed out, as an example, you've got the two stubs on the other side of the road, which talks about, and that's clearly a connection point. So those are the types of things that when you start evaluating helps determine whether or not it's going to be a precedent. Okay. Um, going, going back, uh, the, the price range and the square footage that we've seen of these homes, $250,000, um, uh, that's bigger than my house. So I don't see the size of this home or the price of these homes being an issue. Uh, we've got homes, all different values up and down our block. Uh, that doesn't really matter to me. It's it's part of, uh, well, I, actually on our street, it was a dead end to the north. Uh, the street was opened up and there's a lot of building to the north of us. Do we have a lot more traffic? Absolutely. But I think the city is doing better for it. So anyway, I wanted to cover that. Um, the last thing I, I saw something and I heard something about uh, traffic. Uh, Traffic is going to happen when when building occurs, and there was some discussion about traffic on Hillcrest, and obviously we're working on a plan to repave and redo Hillcrest. And uh, I know it was a bicycle death trap until we got a, a little bit more work done on a bike trail out there. But I I, I really believe that um, what I'm what I'm seeing. And what I'm hearing from uh, your office, all of all of the work that uh, PNC put into this, as, as well as uh, uh, Seth and Brandon, that this development fits into what we're trying to do in this community. Everything is not going to be huge, although I would consider this pretty decent size from from my perspective. I don't know how other people feel about it, but uh, at the end of the day, I, I think. Uh, you've established what the criteria was that was put into this as far as the zoning change. And I, I don't see any, anything that I've heard uh, in opposition to this that says we're doing something wrong. So that's the end of my question slash comment section. 
Well, I'm going to add something to it real quick. I had a couple of people email me and said they were against any kind of cheap low rent housing being put in here. And I'm going, oh my, what's going on here? Because most of these lots are bigger than my lot. And I didn't pay anywhere near what the lowest price is going for these houses. And, and to me, this is far better than apartment houses going in there. I think it's exactly what, what our city needs. So I'm, I'm fully in favor of this. I would agree. And just, it can, I guess it maybe repeats a little bit, but it is a unique setting. It is much better than apartment. I mean, it, it, you know, there already is enough apartments over in that area. And I do think that that is a, a nice price point for like what they said, first and second time home buyers, which is uh, filling a gap that we definitely have right now. I think I'm the one dissenter and I, I don't want apartment buildings either. I agree that in theory, everything in theory is great. It welcomes young families. It's a nice transitional piece. 50 foot frontage is just so small for a uh, frontage on a lot. So that is my one sticking point. And um, I, just, I just can't get behind it with a 50 foot frontage. So I, in theory, it all makes sense. Part of me is saying, well, then why don't you vote for it? <laughs> but I just, the density is, it has always been an issue. Um, and, and even as Seth said, we're bringing people to a less dense area and then we're putting them in a dense area. So I, that's kind of my, my thought process. But I do appreciate all the work that's gone into it. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm betraying you, Charlie. Oh. <laughs> you work so hard on it. But, uh, and, and you know a lot public. more about it than I do. Are we still in public hearing? Mm -hmm. Oh, we are. I'll hold off until we want to start our other comments. We are. Yeah, thanks, John. Charlie, I just have a real quick question for you in your memo, as I mentioned on page um, five of the memo, but 170 of the packet, you mentioned points one and two in terms of your recommendation. Uh, I got to admit, I didn't go back and watch the P and Z discussion on this, although I know that it, it was quite winded or maybe winded is the wrong word, but quite long and, and thorough maybe is a better word um, there. Uh, so just so that I understand, this recommendation that has been um, ran by Seth and, and Brandon, or when council votes on this, is that without this recommendation in place? I assume it's the latter. Yeah, so two things on that. The recommendation that I made to the Planning and Zoning Commission had those two conditions that you list there. The Planning and Zoning Commission added two additional conditions on that, one of which was to make the minimum lot size 6,000 square feet and then to limit the development to single family homes. Um, so those four conditions are actually the recommendation that you're reviewing from the Planning and Zoning Commission. Now the PRD plan that was submitted that's in the packet, you'll see the date on there. I believe the date was uh, May 25th. I, I, it was last week or the week before sometime. So the updated preliminary development plan that was included in your packet includes all of those conditions as it implemented all of those conditions. Okay. Very good. That's what that was my question. So, okay. so those four conditions, the two from you and the two from PNC, uh, have been incorporated then or will be incorporated into their yes, correct. And I apologize, I should have mentioned that as part of my. I, I, it's, it was just easier for me to ask than to try to wrap my head around it. So, um, I appreciate that. Uh, any further questions for anybody? Very good. Uh, at this meeting, that uh, this time, I assume Jackie, we don't have anybody calling in. Is that correct? No calls and no emails. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Um, hearing none and seeing none, no additional comments. I will close this public hearing and move on to item four B, which is first consideration of ordinance approving a proposed development plan and rezoning from the R three mixed residential zoning district to the R five planned residential district. Motion to approve. Second. First and a second. Further discussion? Yes, Mayor. Um, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this and pondering and reading all the emails and, and the, the um, letter that was sent to us by Tom and, and then uh, received a phone call from um, Danita Peterson and, and spoke with her as well. Um, went back and forth on it. Um, I'm where Greg's at on this. Um, I, you know, 
clear back when this initially, when I first come, came on council, um, and we were looking at that preliminary plat, and it was going to be apartment buildings. And I know that you know we need some of that, but I was never really excited about that. Um, um, fortunately, this development has not moved as long as, as fast as, as we have along here, and, and my impatience had grown, and, and so when I saw this opportunity, um, oh, when they first um, brought it forward, um, I was pretty excited about it, and 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 still am today. Um, I, while I I do consider density, I don't think that this is near as dense as what it would have been um, had it been some you know, 48 plexes or some you know, some 32 plex. I mean, there those could have been some pretty good sized buildings in there, and I think we would have had a lot more density. We would have had a lot more of a transient. Um, um, people in there. Um, here you have uh, single family dwellings, which I think fits the neighborhood more. Um, you know, I, um, I think this is a good plan. I, I do know in, in the work I do with, with developers and, and doing signage into different um, housing developments and stuff that in and around the, uh, the metro area that, that Pretty much almost everything's a PUD anymore, and, and um, part of that is is because of the, land, the way the land is. It's it's not always easy to to do, and this is not an easy piece of land to do. Um, I, I'm I'm excited about it. I think this this will work. I, I understand the concerns from the neighbors. Um, you know, it's it's changed, and you know, um, my grandma lived. Well, actually, both my grandmas live in in uh, Vintage Hills, and and uh, my one grandma looks out over it and, and she made the comment to me that there goes my my field that I get to look at. And I said, yeah, but you knew that coming in that someday that would be out. So and she said, well, I'm of the age. Who knows? They may they won't be built yet. So and I said, but anyway, um, I, so um, it, it gave us a lot of consideration and it's not an easy one, especially when, you know, uh, people I represent in this ward and I get a whole long list of emails and, and people that, that don't want it and it, and it makes it really tough. Um, you know, like I said, but I, I do sometimes, uh, this is where, where you pay the big bucks and uh, sometimes you have to make those decisions. And I think this one is probably better for the community. Um, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm pretty excited to see this move forward. So. I think it amounts to, I don't like my choices. <laughs> right. I don't want apartments and I don't want to spend time. So right. it's probably the lesser of two people. Thanks, John, appreciate that. Anybody else want to speak? We do have a first and a second. I'm Hearing sorry. no others. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there another? Okay, very good. Jackie, please. Councilmember Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Nay. Southall? Aye. Marching? Aye. I have one vote, Jackie. Thank you, Council, for that discussion. Uh, moving on to item five is campground rezoning. Um, item A is a public hearing, once again, on rezoning a parcel of land from A1 Agricultural Zoning District to A2 Mixed Agricultural Zoning District. At this time, I'd like to open this public hearing. Can I make a final comment on that? Or are we beyond that? Yeah, I'm sorry. On which one, I'm sorry? What we just voted, it was just voted on. Is that allowed or out of order? I don't know. Mayor Shaw has to address it. Yeah. Mayor, may I make a comment? I, I can't see who you are, but yes, sure, go ahead. It's the <laughs> it's Tom. Yes, Tom. Again, it's Tom. Uh, again, I appreciate your time and your concern for this. It was a long one. Uh, and in the long run, I'm thinking you probably made the right decision. However, I want you to know that I've read comprehensive plan and the zoning codes upside down, inside out, the old top plan and the new. And nowhere does it say that zoning requests will be taken individually and exceptions can be made. Nowhere. But also in the comp plan, it does say, and I quote, under Iowa law, land use regulations such as zoning ordinances must be established and enforced in accordance with an approved comprehensive plan. Clearly you have voted against Iowa law. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Charlie, go ahead on this um, on this campground result. Okay. Okay. Make sure we're right there. Um, so really quick, council will recall um, at their January meeting this year, you approved the rezoning that is shown here on the green area on the map here above. Um, very simply, as they've gotten into the planning stages of this campground, they have realized that they need an additional about 100 foot strip of land that's shown here in the blue to be included in this rezoning. So they are just kind of bringing an amended plan forward to include that area, uh, which requires the council to go through the normal process for rezoning. So. Um, if there's any additional questions on any of that, I'd be happy to answer. Hopefully everybody remembers the campground rezoning. Uh, the only other thing I will note is there is a request from the applicant to waive second and third consideration since you have already deliberated on this. Um, so just want to make sure that that's noted. That's in the packet. Any questions for me? Dick, was there any concerns from neighbors or anything? Okay. Nope, we didn't get any comments on this okay. one. Nope. Jackie, anybody uh, online? Um, I, I'm checking. All right, thank you. And just for clarification, Charlie, the area then to the what to the east of that um, request that has already been zoned the way the landowner wants it for that development of the park ground. Yep. Campground. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes. Yep. So suspending the other two votes is not. Terribly extraordinary. Mayor Shaw, there's been no calls and no emails. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Any further questions for Charlie? If not, I'll close this public hearing and move on to item 5B, which is first consideration of a request rezoning a parcel of land from A1 Ag Zoning District to A2 Mixed Ag Zoning District. Motion to approve. Second. Second. First and second, Mr. Kling, I believe. Discussion? Jackie? Council Member Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Salco? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Very good. To the request then is item uh, 5C, consider waiving additional readings of the ordinance rezoning a parcel of land from the A1 Ag Zoning District to A2 Mixed Agricultural Zoning District. I so move. Second. John, you want to give your speech? Okay. Yeah, that this one uh, <laughs> kind of threw me a curveball there. Normally, I wouldn't do this, but uh, again, this is, gives us this opportunity. So, <laughs> I always want you to have an opportunity to talk. Anybody else? Very good, Jackie. Councilman Mer Schroeder. Aye. Salfo. Aye. Marchant. Aye. Hewlin. Aye. Parker. Aye. Kling. Aye. I have no new business on the agenda this evening. We'll move on to other business. That first item under other business is the city manager to report. Mr. Waller has a number of here. Ryan? I'm going to defer my, my time to Michelle Patrick. Hi, Michelle. Hello. It's good to see you all in person. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like the Zoom meetings, but this is nice. <laughs> Michelle Patrick, director of the public library. Uh, I'm here to talk to you tonight about our plan to reopen the library, and I can tell you no one wants to reopen it more than me, but we need to do it in a safe and responsible way. The first step in, or in reopening the library is kind of counterintuitive. It is to reduce the need to enter the building, so we increase some of our services so people don't have to come in the building um, if they don't want to, but still receive services, and the most important part of that is moving all of our programming online. Last summer, during the month of um, month June, July, we had 75 programs at the library. More than 3,200 people attended those programs. That's you know not an option for us this year. So we have been doing some online programming, but it will all be online for at least the month of June and July, and then we'll look at the we'll look into the fall when we get to that point. We will be expanding curbside pickup. Right now, that is three days a week. And once the building is open, if the building's open, we will have curbside pickup. So you don't have to come in the building to get your items. And then of course, we've been expanding our virtual resources, shifting some money, putting some more money, some audio books, things like that. 
the next step is to promote that social distancing. The big one is to remove all the group seating in the library, which is most of it. Um, and so there will be some seating here and there, but would, people won't be able to sit in groups. Public computers, if you remember, that's a real issue for us. There's six computers right in the middle. People sit shoulder to shoulder. Uh, most of those will be closed. So we'll have one on one side and one on the other side. And we do know that um, going into the future, that's an issue we need to address how to do that public computers. But at least for the summer, we will open up just a couple of them. So they are distance. Toys removed from the children's library temporarily. Also the games. So games are really popular to play in the library, particularly the middle grade. They like to come with their friends and play cards and stuff like that. So the you can still check out games, but we'll have to remove the games if you can play in the library. Then the next step for opening the building is to increase the safety protocols. So the books right now are being uh, quarantined for at least 72 hours. That's in accordance to CDC guidelines. We'll continue that through the summer at least. Um, additional disinfecting. Plexiglass shields will be installed right there at the checkout counter and then of course staff, any kind of um, protective equipment they need, we will provide them in the mask, the gloves, all of that kind of thing. And then the last piece of opening the library is, is just signage to help people understand what the expectations are and just remind them, most people know, but just to kind of keep that, that going. So at this point right now, when we look at opening the building um, sort of tentatively, of course, everything changes uh, any day. They could change. We're sort of looking at June 15th. That's the hope anyway. And uh, again, that's a very tentative date. You don't want people to start thinking that that will happen. Uh, and if that is the date, that would put us right where the Metro is gonna be in terms of opening their library. So we'd be right in that target. Questions? You know that I have a comment? Yes. I know that I have a few advanced Sunshine kids who would be so excited to have these staffing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Other comments? Looks like a well thought out plan. Good job. Thank you. I, I will um, sort of echo something Councilman Kling said earlier. We were one of the first cities to put our plans together, and other uh, libraries have used our, our plan that we did as a city as sort of a blueprint of how they were going to open those again. So we were ahead of the game on that one. Good job. Good job. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. This is a tag team effort. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Charlie hasn't had a chance for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, so thank you, council members and mayor. I thought he's behind us, we can't see him, but um, yeah, the Zoom meetings are definitely difficult to get to. Um, but Doug Byland, um, Parks and Recreation Director, trying to update some of our facility usage guidelines, which I'll echo what Michelle said, they change daily, weekly, hourly, secondly, everything it seems like. So trying to be flexible but also trying to ensure the safety of the community. Um, so we'll all start here with this first, first slide. Um, and as you know, the governor did allow a lot of the facilities that we operate with on the parks department to possibly open starting today. So what we're looking to do um, is once we do open this as part of our plan is to have all the, have signs like this. So this one example here, talks about the steps that people can do to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Like there's a, many business owners now when they walk into the store now, it tells us that they need to be washing their hands, personal hygiene, um, ensure social distancing, um, do not visit parks or anywhere that you're at if you've been sick. Um, also make, make some note of those that are 65 or older or have pre-existing conditions, please stay home at this time. Um, so we'll have those specific signage at every facility. Also have specific signage for each different facility. So once we open playgrounds, it would say our playgrounds are not disinfected, but please bring your hand hygiene at those kinds of things. Um, we talk about facility rental users because a lot of people use our sports complex, shelters, activity center, those kind of places as well. We wanna make sure that those users that do rent that implement the safety measures that we have posted, that it's there from our Department of Public Health, CDC, and so on and so, on and so forth. Now I'm also working right now to get acknowledgement of a COVID-19 release form 
that those users that do rent a facility will ensure that the safety measures uh, that have been requested and recommended are implemented for their activity or their event that they're having. So with that being said, um, our first step here is to talk about park facility usage guidelines, um, the things that we're looking to hopefully open tomorrow. Um, would be playgrounds, as we talked about before. We are not planning to go out and disinfect playgrounds every single day or every single minute or every single hour or anything like that. So we want people to know that sign like you saw before, say playgrounds are open, but we're not disinfecting them. Please you know, use these guidance. Again, maintain your social distancing, avoid crowds, stay home if you're sick. All of these things are gonna be posted at each playground. Uh, we also look into restrooms as well. Now, something different there, which we already do, but we'll disinfect those daily like we already do. It's a lot, a lot different environment, obviously, inside a restroom. So we will do those. Um, but again, to remind people to maintain their distance, all of these things are gonna be posted at each restroom facility. Uh, we'd open the skate park with, again, signage at the front gate there. People have, there's also limitations that we have to have for um, capacity in the skate park, even outdoors, is still like 380 people with the area that's in the skate park. So we won't have to, we shouldn't get to that 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 um, capacity there. Um, for shelters, we'll start beginning people to allow to rent those again, reserve those. Um, again, they will have to acknowledge that they're going to enforce, ensure that the social distance taking part in place, whether it's a family reunion, birthday party, any event they <coughs> might have. Um, pickleball courts at the YMCA, we're planning to get those, get those back built or installed again, and they would be ready with, again, the signage that reminds people to keep their social distancing, bring their own hand hygiene because we're not going to disinfect any of those surfaces there. Um, also let them know the YMCA right now is currently with member, members, members only, so their access is going to be limited. They will not be able to get in there and go to the restroom or anything like that. So please bring your hand hygiene with you. Um, and then the amphitheater, another area will be open again with, with signage. If somebody wants to have an activity, Friday Night Live or one of those other events that are coming up, hopefully later in the summer, they're going to need to ensure that those guidelines are met. So keep on going. I have a lot of things to talk about. Um, the, next, the next park facility that we're talking about is. Um, the Pickard and Pickard Park and most park ball fields, the softball fields we have there, looking to open practices again. This is one of those things that the governor's allowed. Um, people have been chomping at the bit to go out and play baseball as outdoors and softball and the things that they can do there. Um, we will put signage up at the entrance of each field, at the entrance of each dugout, the gates, so people know that they need to still maintain their social distancing when they're not, not in the field itself, when they're not playing the game. Um, and then if keep, do not have gatherings in the dugout and all of these kind of things we've been, we've been hearing. Um, we look to open these to games and tournaments starting June 13th, so possibly next weekend. Um, but organizers must implement those guidance. And a lot of these organizations that are wanting to have events have already put together waivers for their participants, put together plans that we've talked about um, high school games and so on. They're adjusting how they're going to do the games kids that are coming there have to have sure they're not sick, that they have tested the fever, all those, those things that we've, we've been all hearing about that will have to be in place. Um, we'll look to at least at the beginning, more than likely to keep our concessions closed, but when we do that, we'll limit them to prepackaged things, bottled water, Powerade, those kind of things, candy bars, chips, nothing that's gonna take a long time, so we don't have a long line, um, plexiglass shields, uh, Maybe order in one window and pick up in the next window, that kind of thing, so we can keep people moving through. Um, so that's what we do there. Unfortunately, a part of this, um, as per the governor's last proclamation last week, um, senior centers are still closed through June 17th, so we would keep the activity center and senior center closed. Um, and as that gets lifted and we'll look at whether or not we can open those up but again so many things that happen in the senior center are closed they're in place they're playing cards like we talk about the library that we're taking away there um, and the population that come there are definitely more vulnerable than, than the other people using our facilities so 
so keep <coughs> watching on those. <coughs> um, then for our recreation programs, um, we'll keep monitoring each of our recreation programs um, and look at them and evaluate each one whether or not we can accommodate the guidelines that the governor has, public health has, CDC has, National Recreation and Park Association have for guidance on these programs. So those all, again, whether we can maintain social distancing, maintain hand hygiene, um, limiting attendance for people if they have are sick, encourage them to wear face coverings if, when, once we start getting to programs. Limiting the use of shared equipment, um, daily disinfection of shared equipment. So if we had T-ball league, for example, we'd have to disinfect bats and balls and helmets and all this kind of thing. Um, all of our programs would have signs posting at the facilities, but then also guidance on their registration information. So they knew what we're gonna do to help to ensure limitations of the spread on their registration information so they can make a decision on whether or not they wanna participate in the program or not. And then possibly again, looking into the, the they know that we're trying to limit the spread of this, ensure their health safety, but they're gonna have Everything we're not going to be able to ensure everything can happen there. So, um, just a couple of highlights here about the programs that we've had, and this is just a small list of programs that have been canceled. Um, youth softball, for example, way back in in early April, T-ball that's supposed to be starting here in the next week. Um, the police and fire academies, the bike fest is another one was supposed to be this weekend. Um, our outdoor movies and all of our senior programs. It, unfortunately, it's a big list. This is just a few of them. But our staff's really been trying to focus on things that we can do. Um, so some of the things we've done so far, our flashlight Easter egg hunt, which was supposed to happen, gosh, I can't remember now, it's late March. Um, <laughs> it was beautiful weather and that day it snowed and ice. So good thing we didn't have it, but um, we delivered Easter egg hunt kits to, to 65 <clears throat> families or eight, 75 families in a couple of days so they could still have the Easter egg hunt at their house, flashlight Easter egg hunt. Um, we did our plant sale, which had over $10,000 worth of sales, over 1,700 plants through our horticulture department, our marketing department, put together an online brochure as fast as we could and got orders out, so we've done that. Is that more than it's, years past? It's year? more than last year. Wow. It's oh. right close to the biggest we've had. Wow. So um, I know we, we upped our yeah, purchase this it year. kind of made it easier when you can see the picture and you know exactly what it's right. going to have. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then even this this uh, this Saturday we'll be having a drive-through bike helmet giveaway as part of the Mayor's Youth Council has done Bike Fest as you know, and part of that has always been bike helmet giveaway from Frank Blank Children's Hospital donates bicycle helmets. We had all these helmets. We got to get them out to people. We put a post on social media on Wednesday, and we had seventy-five of them accounted for in two or three hours on Wednesday. So we'll be giving away 90 plus bicycle helmets at a drive through at the activity center on Saturday morning. So trying to do things differently. Um, future modifications that we have in the next couple of weeks, we're hoping to start adult softball in probably the week of June 15th. Once we get teams all lined up, maybe yoga in the park and get out there as we can get spread area spread out. Lots of virtual things if you've gone and done maybe yoga or other things that we already had, um, trying to get those programs online. So lot so we have more unfortunately now some of the, the other part um and the, the next big big question for us and everybody in the community is um veterans and more aquatic center for the summer uh, our staff's been researching this evaluating it with the guidelines for the cdc again public health um, working with people and getting networking all over the state all over the country i don't know how many zoom meetings we've been on with over 500 people at the same time um, Throughout this, we've also included our commissions, both the full commission and the Park and Recreation Commission. They've met each two or three times already. Um, so they knew what, what we're looking at, what we're trying to do, the questions we're trying to answer and so on. Um, at a joint meeting with the Memorial Bu Building Commission that we had, I'm sure that up there, on May 27th, um, the full commission voted four to one to close for the entire season. And the Park and Recreation Commission also voted five to zero make the recommendation for this year. Um, just really quick, this was updated. I checked it at five o'clock. This is through Iowa Park and Recreation Association. There has been 20 cities confirmed, actual said that they are going to close, including Clive and Winterset and Carlisle. 
There's plenty of other bigger ones. I can get the listers out there. Um, and there's hundreds of them around the community, or around the country that have done the same thing. So um, what we're looking to do here um, in our recommendation, is a close, oh, I'm sorry, is a close for the season due to several factors. Um, and not limited to these. Monitor enforcing and social distancing and capacity reductions will be extremely difficult, sorry. Um, disinfection of shared surfaces, uh, removal of seating areas and the closing and closing attractions around them. So we would not let people have the area to sit um, because we have to keep continue monitoring them all the time. One of the things that with aquatic center is no one there will have any way to really protect themselves. So there's no masks, there's no PPE, there's no face shields. No gloves, no shirts, no shoes, nothing like that. So um, this would be extremely difficult. Um, the risk to our employees, uh, we would be uh, just really right up front. We would be asking lifeguards to jump in the water and grab people and do out, do CPR on them without any of their per, 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 personal protection equipment that our paramedics, our doctors, anybody are, are at liberty to be able to use. They will not be able to do that. To jump in the water and not only themselves swim, but pick somebody up out of the water at the same time. So that'd be very difficult. Um, recruitment and training of staff. We haven't been able to train any new staff throughout this whole entire um, emergency. And several staff are questioning whether or not they would want to even do that as well. Um, Warren County is still experiencing community spread as the mayor talked about earlier. Um, we know there's consumer confidence. We've had several people call and cancel their press passes already without any decision being made. Uh, we'll have reduction in revenue and we will definitely increase, would increase our operations trying to institute all the guidelines that would have to take place. Not to mention then screening and monitoring of people coming into the pool and what we would need to do if somebody tested positive or became sick while they're there. So we'd have to clean, this and close everything for a day, disinfect, and so on. So, I said a lot. You did have any questions? Um, we debated and deliberated and talked to other department heads and other communities, all that stuff. Okay. Looks like a lot of good decisions, especially hard, the hard decisions. Yeah. And we definitely haven't just like, spoke. we've been considering this probably since March 13th when the initial first yeah, thing. Well, yeah, once again, you know, good planning has, has drawn good decisions. I think very well. Nice job. Will you be able to take advantage of that, not have anybody there to take care of any of the updates or things you need to get done? Yeah, so that would be first step is to try to get the things once the fiscal year is over and try to get to the projects for next fiscal year. Yes, we still need things to do, slide steps, but you know, things that we've already identified in our capital get those moving so we're ready to go for next year. And, and with that, I'm assuming that the money will come out of reserve funds <clears throat> in Parks and Rec. We're, we're going to, before we go too far down this path, we're going to have a presentation on our next council meeting. Okay. Andy's prepared a presentation working with department heads on financial impacts that we're anticipating. A number of them are going to include uh, Parks and Rec, maybe one of the biggest departments that's hit. So we've got a series of levers that we would present to council as, as we're monitoring this, this is what we would recommend happen in what phase as we kind of monitor the economic forecast. Okay. I think it's a little too early to right. share some of them. Okay. Perfect. Two comments, so a comment and a question. One, obviously, yes, I appreciate it. It was a hard decision, but the consequences of not making the right decision are far more difficult for us, the whole community to endure. So thank you. Um, the other thing I was curious about, are we allowing those people who had already purchased season passes to roll them over to 2021? What our plan is to do is refund, fully, do full refunds on all the swim lessons and aquatic center season passes. We'd start that tomorrow and get that through. Um, It'll take a little bit longer than normal because we're looking at another 140 families at least to have these. Um, so we're letting we'll let it in the information that goes out as soon as we can. It'll probably take four to six weeks maybe instead of two to three. So definitely refund everybody fully all the amounts that everybody's due to. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
And I assume that's just simply then giving people the option to defer yeah. there. Okay. We thought about waiting and then by the time we call them back and then like, yeah, is this is just gonna be quicker, faster, get every, we get everything done so we know it's right and be ready to move on. <clears throat> Well, Doug, the big fool user, of course, is the supplier for the best decision. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one, but that's just. And if it'll give other people opportunities, Council of March and I will be like, it's our, our skate park uh, usage. <laughs> give other <All> people. Right. <laughs> okay. We wear helmets. <laughs> oh. He's going to need more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Yeah, Thanks, thank Doug. Thank you. Thanks, Doug, for your time. Yep. Is there any, before we get off of this topic, is there any, is everybody comfortable with the recommendations that have been brought before you? Yes. yes. Any yeah. Okay. Um, I think Doug's emotion pointed out, and Michelle hit on it too, just how much the team cares about the work that they do. Um, and so just the decisions, as I've said before, nobody gave us a guidebook on how to manage through this. And so um, the work that the team has done together has been phenomenal. And I think the results show, but just for those watching at home, um, and I think you all know that these decisions are not easy to make, um, not easy to bring forward, um, but it's done uh, with the safety of the community at the forefront. <clears throat> So um, thank you for the support and, and the feedback. Um, I'll rattle through the next couple items pretty quickly. Um, in your packet was a letter from Cheryl Gertz. She's the um, director of the Indian Old Preschool. As you know, uh, we've had conversations with them previously. Um, they've been trying to look at places to secure ground so they can uh, pursue building a new school. Uh, I know they've outgrown the facilities. Um, and so in there is a, a request that um, perhaps the planning and zoning could begin discussions and kind of look at um, looking at exploring the, the special use permit uh, process for preschools and other zoning districts. Um, as we talked about this as a staff, this is this kind of presents a nice springboard into the next phase after the comp plan has been approved is get the planning and zoning beginning to look holistically throughout the community at the zoning districts. One thing that we, when we got this letter, one thing that we talked about was the topic of churches. We've heard a number of times, why is a church going on our main highway commercial corridor, which is highest and best use as retail commercial, something that generates property tax, property tax and sales tax for the community. It's not common to see churches in commercial areas. So when you look at that, um, there, are there better places for the churches to go um, from a zoning district standpoint. So that would be a nice springboard into the, the process that Charlie talked about. So we're looking for permission from the council on behalf of uh, Ms. Gertz um, on IPS um, to kind of begin those discussions with the PNZ. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next is, as you know, and uh, Councilman <coughs> Kulin and Councilman Schroeder, um, we, we're nearing the end of our fiscal year. And so I mentioned earlier, what we do is we do a special meeting where the only thing on the agenda is to pay the bills. Um, so we're proposing June 24th at 9.30. It literally is a two, if, if that, it's no more than two minutes. Does it matter to the packet system size for which day? Is it the 24th, the Wednesday or the Thursday? Uh, Andy and I talked about it uh, this morning. We were thinking Wednesday was in the packet, my, her apologies. 24th, it's a Wednesday. At 9.30? 9.30 in the morning. And we can Zoom, it could be a Zoom thing, so you don't even have to come here. It's fine for me. I don't know about anybody else. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and then the, uh, the last item for discussion and direction, if you recall, when we started the, the, when the pandemic uh, began, Hitting, um, we proposed to you to temporarily suspend the various uh, penalty charges for our sewer. This was uh, done in concert with IMU. 
uh, and their late fees, uh, they had a discussion at their last board meeting where they directed staff to bring a 30, 30 day extension. And we wanted to bring it up to council, see if there's concurrence to do that. If so, then we would bring it back to the June 15th meeting and report on results of IMUs. Yes. Okay. And then the last item on is just receive and file correspondence. Move to receive and file. Second. Jackie. Member Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Plain? Aye. And Ryan, just to make sure the other department heads, uh, Rick, Melissa, Andy, and Greg, and AP, they have nothing to add tonight. I'm sure that if they did, they've typed it in Zoom, but I didn't hear of anything coming into the meeting. <laughs> I didn't see anything either. So I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, Mayor Shaw? Yes, please. Very quick, Brenda Southall, sorry, I should have shouted that out. Very quickly before we go, um, I'd like to add a couple of comments. One is a reminder to everyone, if they have not already voted in Charles primary, to get out and exercise your right to vote. And the second is to wish our LGBTQ plus community and their allies a happy Pride Month. June 1st. Thank you. That is all. Good job. Good. Thank you. Motion to adjourn, anyone? Motion to adjourn. Second. second. First and second. Discussion? Jackie? Councilmember Hewlin? Aye. Parker? Aye. Kling? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Southall? Aye. Marchant? Aye. Thanks all. Take care. Good job out there.